Turkish author Orhan Pamuk's famous and exploration of the art and philosopher of Ottoman unity painting in his 2001 novel My Name is Red. Pamuk's work clearly suggests parallels between the Middle East and miniature tradition and the 20th century Western period of art. Why would a contemporary reader with a Western education find My Name is Red appealing? Why do Middle Eastern paintings themselves or Islamic themselves or Islamic philosophy seem to lack the proximity to the West that is suggested by the novel. A response may perhaps be found in another set of questions. What could be the inspiration for a 20th century author who writes about Ottoman miniaturists? Ottoman history, clearly, Islamic philosophy perhaps, but what about 20th century Western philosophy? This paper primarily examines whether the proximity between Islamic and modern Western philosophy of art implied by Pamuk is really possible, or whether Pamuk's assertions are instead influenced by 20th century Western philosophy of art, including the ideas of Maurice Moniponti and Jacques Derrida. I believe that the philosophy of art portrayed in My Name is Red is at least unconsciously conditioned by, if not consciously fashioned after, recent Western philosophy of art. Nonetheless, the novel opens up a space for inquiry into a possible nexus between the two art forms, specifically miniature paintings and the 20th century Western abstract painting, which seems to be not only historically, but philosophically radically apart from each other. As Paul says, the old masters of Shiraz and Herat claimed that a miniaturist would have to sketch horses unceasingly for 50 years to be able to truly depict the horse that Allah envisioned and desired. They claim that the best picture of a horse should be drawn in dark, since a tr true miniaturist would go blind working over that 50 year period, but in the process his hand would memorize the horse. We read in My Name is Red that a miniaturist needs to, needs to paint the same figure over and over again to achieve a depiction that is perfect or in accordance with God's perception. After many years of illustrating the same form, it would appear the process is memorized not only by the miniaturist's eye, but also his body. Thus, a miniaturist can carry on painting even after the loss of his eyes to the demands of his work. According to the miniature tradition described in My Name is Red, going blind after having devoted a lifetime to painting is reason to be proud. It is believed that God's vision or perception of the world can be manifested only through the memory of a blind miniaturist. Blindness is the final destination of the miniaturist in his search for God's vision. The inevitable perspective of God can only be attained through memory, after the eyes have perished, I quote. When this image comes to the aging miniaturist, that is, when he sees the world as Allah sees it, through the darkness of memory and blindness, the illustrator will have spent his lifetime training his hand so it might transfer this splendid revelation to the page. However, the substitution of visual and bodily memory for eyesight is more important than physical blindness. As Pong put, puts it, a blind miniaturist could see the horse of God's vision from within the darkness. However, true talent resided in, in a sighted miniaturist who could regard the world like a blind man. The idea of God's darkness is central to the thought of miniaturist in My Name is Red. This darkness exists before the art of miniature and will continue after it. Both color and sight come from darkness and by using them, the miniaturist attempts to regain the God's darkness. Therefore, to illustrate is to remember the darkness. Remembering is crucial for a miniaturist, since without it, God and his darkness are lost. The project of Ottoman miniature paintings, as described in My Name is Red, ultimately entails the elimination of a painter's individuality, or of any kind of distinction between the miniaturist on the one hand, and God or God's vision, as well as the world created by God on the other. Thus, Perspective is banned because it implies a human point of view that does not coincide with God's perception. Further, individual artists ought to not to distinguish themselves through signatures or particular styles. The signature is seen as a sign of arrogance, while style can only imply imperfection. As Pamuk writes, it was Satan who first said I, it was Satan who adopted a style, it was Satan who separated East from West. I quote, wherever the blind miniature's memories reach Allah, there reigns an absolute silence, a blessed darkness, and the infinity of a blind page. Maurice Moyne continues as I says on starting, as I says on starting, I am right, and there is a multifaceted sequence of painting as a form of vision and of coming into being. According to Moyne Ponti, there is a paradox in vision, 
می پرسید و اینات می پرسید چون زرام دزدیدن. But those are subs in the work. To understand the nature of painting, which is the bodily relation of the painter to the work, one should primarily comprehend what it means for a human being to be in the work. For my point, our abilities to perceive and move are in inextricably entangled, and thus vision cannot be made up of thoughts or representations. Vision and movement both belong to the body. The human body then experiences itself in a statically visual and also as a part of the world. If the perceiver perceives things from among them, we cannot take for granted that there is a difference between the perceiver and the perceiver. Even before there is a kind of subject that perceives, the body is taken up in a network of perceptible things. Both the seen and the seer are perceivers and perceived at the same time. They are made out of the same stuff. The Cartesian view only represents an assumed dichotomy between the inside and the outside or subject and object. As Mark Fortis states, I call the world is made of the very stuff of the body. Perception, body, and the world are all of the same fabric, or as Mario Ponte calls it, the same flesh. By proposing his notion of flesh, Mario Ponte emphasizes the unconscious ground of conscious experience as a unified thing. He also calls the flesh brute and savage being an ontological basis, or a condition of possibility and of all relations. The concept of flesh is the anonymous visibility, which precedes the dichotomy between self and other, as well as any identification of individual beings. Mario Ponte also approaches the issue of perception through his concept of the universal narcissism of perception. In my opinion, perception is called universal because in the endless interplay of perceiver and perceived, it resists any kind of subjectivity. It is called narcissistic because whatever I see and whatever I'm seen by is ultimately made up of the same stuff. The exchange of gazes cannot be ascribed any subjective origin. It is there before I start perceiving, but what is perceived has not started the game either. Further, the perceiver has a perception of their own perceiving. All is all, this amounts to what Mario Ponte describes as, I call a total or absolute vision, outside of which there is nothing and which closes itself over, both perceiver and perceived. We are speaking here of a field of vision that shows itself abruptly as being made of the diacritical relations between all things as both perceiver and perceived. This is a point at which Marley Pontes and Comus thoughts seem to come intriguingly close. The former's anonymous visibility and total or absurd vision would seem to correspond to the later darkness of God. The concepts on both sides are neither just material nor just intellectual. Being is both the invisible ground and the visibility manifested through it. According to Mario Conti, through painting, Cezanne articulates what phenomenology, phenomenology only indirectly endeavors to show by a philosophical language, which is pre-reflexive perception. By considering not only the real object, but also its appearance to our unstable senses, Cezanne paints a world that has already, and more importantly, continues to come into being. In other words, he paints the world in the process of coming into being. Cezanne's ambition is to account for how we perceive the world as completely accomplished within the temporal finitude of the moment. Nothing can be added to this moment. At best, we can attempt to illustrate it. This kind of perception is a homecoming to nature. It's a brute kind of perception, a bodily one, not judging the world, but bodily digesting it. An inhuman perception that perceives the world as free from human concerns and projects not yet structured by scientific objectivism or intellectualism. What needs to be discovered is the world as pre-given in its facticity, that which Marley Ponte calls there is. However, while we may be made out of the same flesh, things are neither completely familiar nor completely strange to us. Marley Ponte sheds light um, on this imperfect interwovenness of perceiver and perceived through the fundamental reality of a card, gap. There is no exact coincidence between either me as a perceiver and me as the perceived, or me as the perceiver and the thing that is perceived. Since any of the body can be touched and touched, there is always an occur between these two actions. One cannot be sure whether she is touched or also touching at the same time. However, since the two acts are reversible, this does not lead us to, to rationalize the dualism. In other words, the human body can shift between two positions, such as touch and be touched, perceive and be perceived. The perceiver and the perceived are interwoven rather than completely overlapping. For more than there is no absolute stranger 
but neither is everything so familiar that I can properly understand it. The similarity between our bodily way of perceiving and the world we perceive renders the issue of the separation of inner and outer uncertain. When inner is outer and outer inner, what belongs to me, what to the world? Where to draw the lines according to what criteria and how? The paradoxical character of Cezanne's painting for more point is that Cezanne is trying to do something impossible. He wants to paint brute nature by contemplating nature, studying nature and landscapes, while also studying his own emotions, the sensations of the painter. The tensions and positions leading to this paradoxical character are situated between nature and sensations, but also between sensations and the proper philosophical form of thinking. How can one have ambitions of thinking or understanding the world clearly, while at the same time being exposed to the very sensations when he's attempting to think about and understand? This, I believe, is Cezanne's thought. Cezanne's, Cezanne doubts both himself and his artistic ambition, whether he is able truly to render what he sees and whether he can paint it, as Marie Ponty puts it in the way God created it. A miniaturist thought may take on a similar form. According to Pomo, a miniaturist is not painting an image of the world as we know it either. His intention is to reach the, I quote, truly agonizing depiction of the world from an elevated godlike position attained by drawing. He doubts about himself and his artistic ambition, whether he can comprehend what God sees and whether he can paint in the way God sees it. It would appear that the miniaturist cast in my name is red, albeit following a different route leads the artist to a paradoxical and impossible challenge, not too different from that of Cezanne. Illustrating according to God's perception appears similar to illustrating according to an inherent root perception. In both cases, the effort seem, seems to be a struggle without end. According to Moni Ponti, painting is something visible and actually about the invis is actually about the invisible, namely feelings, sensations, of activity. Painting is not a depiction or reproduction of the way things exist in the outside world. The painter attempts to reveal something invisible, something we do not see, but actually, painters paint the invisible regardless of what their ambitions might be. Even if they attempt to paint something representative or illustrative, at best they paint memoirs. As Pong says, memories. Even the most untalented painter, one whose head is empty like those of today's Venetian painters, who draws the picture of a horse, while looking at the horse, we still make the image from memory. Because you see, it's impossible at one and the same time to look at the horse at the and at the page upon which the horse's image appears. End of quote. Another 20th century thinker who connects painting and the blindness and memory is Jacques Derrida. In Memoirs of the Blind, the Self-Portrait and Other Rooms, Derrida claims that drawing is blind. Drawing a line in order to either write a word or sketch something is an act of blind. As Derrida states, the essence of drawing is anticipation and memory. Drawing substitutes a kind of seeing for another, namely mediated for direct seeing. The artist's gaze is torn away from the thing to be drawn on the canvas. There is an invisibility between the thing and its sketch. Therefore, the original painting does not reside in perception but in memory. As Derrida says, the threat must proceed in the night. It escapes the field of vision. Derrida illustrates this point through a certain kind of drawing, namely the self-portrait. One is blind while looking at the line or stroke the trait in drawing a self-portrait. One has to draw from memory, which is blind. Equally, when one looks at one, one's own reflection in order to draw one's own image, one cannot observe the stroke or the line. Thus, one has to continue blindly. One sees without one's eyes. The process involves both the trait and the retrait. It is one of the appearance and retreat. Derrida says, I quote, the subtitle of all these scenes of the blind is thus, the origin of drawing, or if you prefer, the thought of drawing. A certain concept called a memory of the threat that speculates is in a dream about its own possibility. Its, its potency always develops on the brink of blindness. According to Derrida, in losing his sight, man does not lose his eyes. On the contrary, only then man began to think the eyes, and he continues. He sees between the catches a glimpse of the difference. He, keep, he keeps it, looks after it in memory. The exact same point is stressed by Tomo with regard to miniature. First, I quote, 
First the illustrator looks at the horse, then he quickly transfers whatever rests in his mind to the page. In the interim, even if only a wink in time, what the artist represents on the page is not the horse he sees, but the memory of the horse he has just seen. Proof that for even the most miserable illustrator, a picture is possible only through memory. End of quote. However, the conclusion that the miniaturists draw from him, this observation is unique to its cultural context. As Pong says, the active work life of a miniaturist is but preparation for both the resulting bliss of blindness and blind memory. To Mario Ponti, Cezanne was a genius not only because of his force as a colorist, but also because he shows us a new way of seeing, a nice scientific one. What Mario Ponti sees in Cezanne's painting is an ultimate instance of phenomenological work with colors. As Husserl's phenomenological reduction tries to emancipate itself from the presuppositions of false Galilean and Cartesian traditions, Mario Ponti believes Cezanne and he himself face the same dilemma. A new way is needed a way which will emancipate one from dichotomous way of thinking and enable the split between the self and the world, the subject and the object to be overcome. As we have seen, thus perception was to miniaturize what brute perception is to Mario Ponti, a way of transcending that which is human, based on our preconce preconceptions in perception. Miniaturists were defending this kind of perception against the increasing onslaught of Western art with its ungodly innovations, such as perspective. Ultimately, the battle was lost, and the art of miniature event, with its attendant form of transcendent perception, was su superseded by Western forms of artistic e expression. Mario Ponti would seem to come full circle in trying to regain, through the means of Western painting, the very kind of perception that the art of miniature, as described by Tom, originally lost in its encounter with Western painting. To what extent the real connection exists between the philosophies behind Middle Eastern miniature painting and modern Western painting is a question yet to be explored. But it seems safe to say that Pomo's portrayal of miniaturists is to some extent influenced by his own Western influenced cultural develop envelopment. Whether this portrayal is the result of an intentional fallacy aimed at appealing to a Western audience or not, at the very least, one can speak of an unconscious influence on the author resulting from the fact that one cannot escape one's own historicity. Still, I believe that Pong's novel opens up a space for inquiry into a nexus between the East and the West in terms of philosophy of art. After all, an established practice of abstract painting existed in the Middle East centuries before Western art started exploring similar forms of expression, partly influenced by miniature itself, as in the works of painters such as Henri Matisse, Vasily Kandinsky, and Paul Klee. For Mario Ponti, we do not so much look at a painting as we see according to it, says Salon. Aesthetic contemplation is not a matter of subjective attitude, but of how a painting appears to us. I believe a painting teaches us how it wants to be looked at according to its own visual categories. But it's not only our way of perceiving the painting that is influenced by it, but also our way of perceiving the world. The richness of the painting depends on the painting itself, rather than on what the spectator brings to bear on it. Exemplary paintings does always hold a premise, promise of further meanings yet to be discovered. In my opinion, Middle Eastern miniature painting also teaches us a new way of perceiving. It's as rich as Western traditions of painting and promises the possibilities of many further readings since it was originally produced only in the service of the court and was largely kept away from scrutinizing eyes for centuries. It is yet to be discovered both in a literal and in a more important sense.